so welcome to the fourth class of our uh, system software so last class we discussed about the sic xe architecture right and uh, we learned that it is having 1 mb of memory eight registers among which one is uh, a 48 bit register which is a floating point register right and then uh, we just uh, yeah then we also have seen that uh, there are integer data format which is of 24 bit and uh, floating point data format which is of 48 bits and 8 bit ascii codes uh, is used for characters right this things is just a recap quick and importantly we discussed that there are four formats of instructions one is 8 bit which is having only opcode no operands so there is no addressing mode for that format 2 is having two operands which are registers so it's a register to register operations format 3 is having 24 bits and uh, among which 6 bits is uh, opcode and 6 bits are flags and rest 12 bits is the displacement this gives rise to different relative addressing like pc relative base relative immediate and indirect addressing format 4 is a direct addressing which is having 6 bits opcode and 6 bits flag and uh, 20 bits um, 20 bit complete address so e flag will be 1 if it is format 4 instruction and e flag will be 0 if it is a format 3 instruction this differences we have seen and uh, we have discussed that format 1 no in addressing mode format 2 is register to register and format 4 is uh, direct addressing and format 3 gives rise to following set of addressing modes pc relative base relative immediate as well as indirect and uh, Uh, in pc relative target address is calculated by adding the pc contents with displacement and uh, uh, majority of the instructions are format 3 and majority of format 3 instructions are pc related so wherein n and i bits will be 1 and 1 and uh, p bit will be 1 x is 0 b is 0 e is 0 right and uh, we cannot have pc relative with indexing that's not possible but we have seen some examples of pc relative addressing modes right uh, it's a quick recap how it is been calculated is also been told no worry so this will going to be again will reappear when we going to do the assembly right next addressing mode is base relative wherein target address is computed by adding the contents of base register with the displacement and wherein the b flag will be 1 and n and i will be 1 and 1 rest all will be zero if there is no indexing is used right and base relative is supposed to be specified explicitly if at all we found an assembler directive base in our program then it is a base relative addressing if that is not there then it is uh, assembled using pc relative addressing mode so base and no base these two assembler directives is mandatory so as to do it in a base relative addressing so you can see that the instructions are 003 and 006 are assembled using pc relative because the base assembler directive appears after that at 009 so for that reason 0012 and 0015 will be assembled using base relative because they are enclosed between this assembler directive base and no base and the add sum instruction will going to be again pc relative if it is not specified if it is assembler directive base and no base is not used then it is going to be assembled using pc relative addressing if it is format 3 instruction fine uh base relative with indexing also we have seen wherein in base relative with indexing contents of b register is added with displacement with the contents of x the resulting address will going to be our target address right and the displacement is calculated in a reverse order target address minus b minus x will going to give you the displacement this is how the things works so for here n and i usually 1 and 1 x bit is also 1 because it is using index addressing mode b is 1 because it's a base relative p and e are 0 because it is not a pc relative and it's a format three instruction okay one second a class of class of dynamic algorithm okay fine so we have discussed until immediate addressing i think 
So immediate addressing wherein the operand is specified in instruction only. Here, the n bit is 0 and the i bit is 1. It is either 0 only. Don't mind about that. For example, the instruction LDA hash 9 indicating that the value 9, the hash indicates that it is an immediate addressing mode. The immediate value, that is 9, should be loaded onto the accumulator. So for that reason, n is 0, i is 1, x is 0. And also indexed addressing mode cannot be used with immediate addressing mode. That's not possible. P is 0 because it's not a base relative. P is 0, it's not a PC relative. E is 0 because it's a format free instruction. And you can see that in the 12-bit displacement place, we have written the actual value 91001001001. Fine. This is about immediate addressing mode. So we shall continue from the instruction sets of our SIC XA machine. SIC XA machine can use all the instructions that were used in SIC because SIC is a upward computable machine. So for that reason, all the instructions set of SIC can be used with SIC XC. But SIC XC by itself provides some additional instructions like register to register instructions. Because the register to register operations is allowed in format two of format two instructions. So we can use register to register. And remember, we can only perform arithmetic. Register to register arithmetic. Right? Add R, S, comma, T. That is S and T are the general purpose register. S is added with T and the result will be stored in T. Subtract A comma S. There is supposed to be A minus S, but it is A plus S there. So contents of A minus S, the result is stored in S. Here in uh, register to register operations, the destination operand will going to be the second. The second operand is treated as a destination operand. Similarly, the multiplication and division can be seen. As we have floating point arithmetic is also a uh, uh, floating point arithmetic logic is there in SIC uh, XC. We have floating point arithmetic instructions, which are represented as add or subtract or like this, SUBF, MULF, all these things. And one of the operand must be in floating point accumulator, that is F, which is a 48-bit register. And the other operand must be present in memory, 48 bits that way. See, it is, when it is add F memory 3, F contents will be added with mem3, and the result is stored in F itself. Similarly, divide F m3, wherein F is contents is divided by M memory 3 contents, and the result will be stored in so the destination operand in the floating point operations will going to be the floating point accumulator that is F. Okay. Logical instructions, we have few logical instructions along with all the other logical instructions what we had with SIC. One of the logical instruction is TIXR. We have seen the TIX instruction in SIC wherein the contents of X is incremented by 1 and the result, uh, the result is compared with the specified memory location and the conditional code flags will be set accordingly. If it is equal 0, 0, if it is greater than 0, 1, if it is less than 1, 0. Similarly, TIXR is used with X register and one more register. Now the contents of X is incremented by 1 as usual and the incremented contents is compared with the register, specified register. And based on that, the conditional codes will be set, whether greater than, less than or uh, equal right okay have a look at this what TIXR with S is doing is X contents is incremented by 1 and uh, X minus S will be done that is X contents will be compared with S contents if the X is equal to S we are going to get the status word as 0 0 greater than 0 1 less than 1 0 fine this is how it works. Right. COMPR. We have seen the COMP instruction which compares accumulator contents with the memory location. But COMPR instruction is capable of comparing two registers. How it does? Just have a look at this. COMPR S comma T, S and T both are the general purpose registers. S minus T will be done if the result is equal, 0, 0. Status code is this status code will be 0, 0, greater than 0, 1, less than 1, 0. So these two additional logical instructions are there in our SIC XC, which are not there in our SIC machine because 
it says a machine doesn't allow register to register operation. Fine. We shall see some programming examples of SIC XE. So what I have did is I have taken one program which is same, which we solved in our what we call SIC machine. That is copying a value, integer value into an integer variable and copying a character constant onto a character variable. See the declarations first. Alpha is a, is a word one. That means it's an integer variable of oh, oh, one that means 24 bits, three bits. CHZ is a character constant whose value right now is uh, Z, and C1 is a character variable whose size is one byte. Right, and you can see that uh, name of the program is given as uh, transfer. And uh, first instruction load accumulator immediately with the value 20. In, if you remember the SIC program, this 25 also we have declared as an integer constant and have given some name. But now that's not needed because we do have immediate addressing mode in SIC XE. That makes the major difference. We can load the registers with or do initializations in using immediate addressing mode. That's the uh, major advantage compared to our SIC machine. And store accumulator to alpha. The 25 value is loaded onto accumulator. The same value is now being stored into alpha. And I am asking LDCH load a character from where character constant that is Z is loaded onto accumulator. And that will going to be stored now using STCH to C1. We don't have any mechanism to immediately load a character variable or a, a character constant or a, a string into any of the registers. So immediate addressing cannot be used with characters. That's what is uh, uh, not there in the implementation of SIC. Sorry, SIC XE, right? Okay. See, the next program is uh, we are trying to add two arrays, alpha and beta. Both are integer arrays. With the uh, alpha contents will be added with beta and the result is stored in now. Means alpha of zero is loaded with added with the beta of zero and the contents is stored in gamma of zero. Right, this is uh, what the program does. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, now see the initialization. First see the declarations. Alpha is reserved word 100. How many bytes will be reserved? 300 bytes will be reserved. Because alpha is a RESW, integer variable. Of how many locations? 100 locations. Each location consumes three bytes. So totally 100 into three, 300 bytes will be reserved for alpha. Similarly, beta is a integer array. We are reserving 100 locations or 100 integers. That means 300 bytes. Similarly, gamma is also 300 bytes because it's a 100 location. Now let's see the program. We need to take alpha of alpha's first element should be added with beta's first element and the result supposed to be stored in gamma's first element. That's what is the thing. This should be repeated for all the 100 elements. For all the 100 elements. That's what is the thing. Sum is the name of the program being given. We are doing some initialization. What is the initialization? LDX hash 0. Means we are storing 0 value in the X. And this will going to be incremented 3 bytes after adding every element. So ultimately the X value should become 300 then it has completed all the 100 elements. That's what is the idea. And we are loading the uh, yes register with 300. This is going to act as a count for us. When X and S becomes equal, we'll stop. Or else we'll take up one element from alpha and one element from beta, add it and store it in gamma. This is how we're going to be doing. And we are uh, loading T register with three because every time the increment should happen, three bytes. That's the reason we are loading T with 3. And remember, S and T are general purpose instructions. The instruction LDA alpha comma X takes the first element. X is 0. Remember, uh, alpha comma X, that is the first element of alpha and places it into accumulator. Add beta comma X. The beta's first element will be added with the alpha of X, alpha's first element 
which is right now present in accumulator. And the result is stored in gamma complex. Means alpha of 0 plus beta of 0 will be stored in gamma of 0. Next element starts at 3. So for that reason, add r t comma x. T's value is 3. 3 is added with x contains that is 0 and that is stored in x. Means x is incremented by 3. We are using COMPR instruction. Now x is 3, 3 value is compared with s register. s is containing 300. 3 is not equal to 300. 3 is actually less than 300. x is less than s. If it is less than, jump to, jump less than to loop. We will go back to loop. We will take the next element. We will add it. We will store it. Every time we keep on incrementing 3 and 3, 3. At some point, after 100 elements is added and stored, x will going to become 300. When we will compare x comma s, x will be 300, s will also be 300. We will going to get equal to conditional port flags will be set to 0, 0. Now it is no more less than. So for that reason, we will stop the program. So this is uh, one of the SICXE program. I will post you some more examples of SICXE programs. This and all is needed uh, because we need to see exactly how the what they call uh, assemblers can do the assembling of this particular sort of situations. Right? So this completes SIC XC architecture. Now we'll move on to assemblies. Right? We'll start the assemblies. That's what is the next task. What we'll do today. Okay. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Assemblers. We'll be learning about what is assemblers and other things, what are the functions. Along with that, we're going to learn two pass assemblers, implementation of the assemblers. This and all of the uh, matter of discussion in this particular chapter. Actually, this is the next chapter according to your textbook. The first chapter is speaking about system software and class concepts of that and then it presents you with the SIC and SIC C architecture because the same will be the reference machine for us to learn assemblers, learn loaders, linkers and uh, even the macro processors. This and all will be learning keeping SIC and SIC XC as a reference machine. That's why we spend ample amount of time learning the architecture. So this background knowledge is important to proceed further with assemblers. So, you can have one revision on this particular thing so that is going to be a suggestion right okay what is an assembler assembler you can you know that or a compiler takes the program written in high level language converts it into an assembly level language maximum level of conversion that can happen by a compiler is only till the level of assembly language program then the assembler takes up the task assembler takes the those program that is written in assembly language using the machine's instruction set, the machine's addressing mode, machine's memory, machine's register, and then it should convert it into an object code or the machine level language. That's what is the task of our assembler. So it continues from the point where the compiler gave you the assembly language program to convert it into the machine level language or the object. Further, the loaders and Linkers will go to resolve all the external references and the loader prepares a program for loading onto the memory and putting it for execution. So creating the executable file to be precise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is what the assembler does. It takes the program written in assembly language, converts it into a reallocatable object code. It also generates some information that is needed for the further phases of loaders as well as the linkers. Assemblers or, or assembly language program is mainly made up of three types of statements. I'm not telling instructions, I'm telling statements. The statements include everything, declaratives, uh, all other things. What are those three categories? We'll go to see. Okay. The first type of statements we call it as imperative statements, which specifies some action. That's statements that specify the action to be performed during execution. During, during assembly, 
this will be converted into object code. Why I'm telling you this? Every statement in assembly language program will not be converted into object. Only the imperative statements, only the imperative statements will be converted into object code. Rest all others will be a side effect. They will not be converted into object code. So, for example, ADA alpha. What I mean, alpha is a variable. It's the is supposed to be loaded with the loaded onto accumulator. It's an action. And another statement add hash 90 means add the value 90 to the contents of accumulator and store the result in accumulator. It's an action. So any such action statements are usually all the instructions are imperative statements because they perform one or the other operations. Second type of statements what we do have in ALP is declarative statements which does the declaration. They indicate the declaration of variables and constants like RESW, RESB, byte, word, all these things we use for declaring variables and constants. Those and all will come into this category of declarative statements. Right. During assembly, they will not be converted into object code because the only task of the declarative statement is to allocate the memory, allocate an address for it. That's it. They will not be converted into object code. Right. The next is. Uh, uh, they will not be get converted into object code. Yeah. An example: array resw hundred. What I am trying to declare? I am trying to declare an array of hundred elements of the type integer. So each integer consumes three bytes. So three hundred bytes of memory need to be allocated for this for array. That's what is the uh, thing. What the declarative statement is. One more is there: str one byte. str one byte means is a character constant, and the value of the character constant is Hello world. So now 10 bytes of uh, memory will be allocated for this particular str one. So depending on the size specified, that many bytes of memory will be allocated and an address is given for that particular variables or constants uh, by the declarative statements. They will not be converted into object code. They are just allocation of the memory. The next type of statements what we do have is uh, uh, the assembler directives which we have discussed already so they will going to be guidance for our assembler itself to convert the things right uh, assembler directives they are guidance to the assembler about how to assemble the program right they will not be converted into object code as i told only imperative statements will be converted into object code. That means the instructions will be converted into object code, right? Uh, some examples are start, end, base, no base, this and all, and some more assembler directives we are going to see when we are seeing the machine dependent assembler features and all, right? This is an important thing, whether it is an assembler directive, whether it is a, what you call, uh, imperative statement or whether it is a uh, declarative statements, the instruction or the statements will going to be of this form. First starting with a label, next is a nomic, flash one is an operator. After assembly, all the labels will be converted into addresses, all the nomics will be converted into opcode, all the operands will be converted into addresses. You can see one major difference. What is that? Label will appear. I mean, label is a user defined symbol, correct? So label will appear towards the left hand side always correct no and it can also appear in the right hand side for example jlt loop loop is a label that should have an entry somewhere either before or after loop the jump will going to happen to that particular location means that's an address where we are jumping right and uh, label will also appear towards the left hand side or the user defined symbols will also appear towards the left hand side during declaration for example i or a or what you call care set, something like that, which are happening in declarative statements. On the right hand side, they are going to have the size in specific. But if it is an instruction, we may have or may not have a label, but we are going to have the minomic and operator. For example, add, hash 90. Add is the minomic, specifies we need to perform the addition operation. Hash 90 is the value, there is an operator, right? So if it is not hash 90, it is something like add <coughs> MEM3, then MEM3 is a variable 
are a constant may be declared earlier right so that should be converted into address during execution or during assembly process so the user defined symbols appearing towards the left hand side of a monomic or either declarations or the uh, labels where the jump should happen user defined symbols that is appearing on the right hand side of the monomic or the operands that are used in the instruction that's its value should be used to perform the operation so right hand side appearance of the user defined symbols usually happens in imperative statements left hand side happens in declarative statements or just specifying the labels these are the two possible variations that is possible up the sic assembler the assembler should perform the following operations to complete the assembling of a assembly language program first one it should convert all the monomics to its opcode and the opcode will be specified for all the instructions in the instruction set of your machine that is true that is common for all the machines so referring to this opcode table we will going to convert all the monomics to its opcode and remember of Codes will be written in hexadecimal, uh, and that should be used. Uh, convert all the symbolic operands into addresses. All the uh, operands that is appearing on LHS and as well as RHS should be converted into addresses. So, yeah, fine. Perfect. To convert data constants into machine equivalent represents data constants, either integer constants, uh, character constants, should be converted into their appropriate representation. Resolve the declarative statements. Resolve means you should allocate memory for all the declarative statements. Write the object code in the and the assembly listing in a proper format. We are going to see the formats and all later. Right. This assembler, the <coughs> assemblers in SIC, is implemented in two passes. That's why we call it as two passes. Why is it two passes is needed? I told you earlier also. All the SIC and SIC programs. Do the declaration at the end. Means after writing the complete code, we we'll do the declarations. So one pass is needed for allocating memory for all the declarations, and second pass is needed for converting the instructions into monomics and operands. So we need the address to be given first. Then only we can do. But in all other programming languages, usually the declaration happens at the point of use. Or before, so you are uh, you have a fully established symbol table earlier, but in SIC that's not possible. So for that reason, one pass needs to be separately reserved for assembling. I mean, uh, allocating the addresses and populating your symbol table, right? Oh, okay. yeah. Have a look at this. Uh, the operations assembler goes through two passes. First pass we are calling it as a definition pass because we are allocating addresses. We are not doing any conversions here. Assign addresses to all the statements in the program. All, all means all, including assembler directives, declarative, everything. Store the values of all the labels in symbol table. Labels means all the user defined symbols along with this uh, uh, okay. symbol table, right? Do processing of the declarative statements by assigning the memory, right? Perform the processing of assembler directives only few. Precisely speaking about in pass one, we are going to be processing the assembly directives start and end only. Not even base and no base will be processed. That will be processed only in pass two, right? So only few assembly directives will be processed in pass one. Second phase we call it as translation pass. Oh, sorry, second pass we call it as translation pass. In rational in translation translation pass, assemble the instructions. Every instructions here precisely the imperative state. Instructions by converting monomics to opcode and operands to its addresses. Where from I get the addresses? I get the addresses from the symbol table because the pass one have allocated the addresses. Generate the data value for the constants and uh, perform the processing of assembler directives. Those are not done in pass one. That means base, no base, and other sort of assemblers. We have got LT, ORG, and other sort of assemblers that will going to be processed in the pass two, right? Finally, after assembling, we should write the object code in a proper file format. We have a precise file format for the assembler, uh, sorry, the assembly language code to be written, which has got different uh, 
what do you call sections like header record, header text, header text, and all these things. Ah, sorry, reallocation and uh, all these things. So together, all these things is done in two passes. In pass one, only allocating the addresses. In pass two, we are going to do the translation of mnemonics to of foreign operands to addresses, and finally write the object code into a file. Right? This is what is the thing. So the next thing is data structures used in assemblers. We use three different data structures. That is uh, a symbol table called as SIMTAP, a code table of TAP, and a location counter called as LOC CTR. These three data structures are important for us to build the two pass assembly. That we're going to discuss in the next class. So we are running out of the time. I'll stop the meeting here. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question.